morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Glynis Buffalo, and I'm a proud member of Samson Cree Nation. I'm the director of Land Use and Environmental Planning with Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. I'm a registered professional planner with the, with the Alberta Professional Planners Institute, and I just finished my second term on council with the Institute. I will be the moderator for today's, se today's session, which is being recorded. However, all attendees, cameras and microphones have been disabled and no attendees will be recorded as part of this session. All registrants will have access to this recording at a later date via the AP APPI YouTube channel. For the purposes of, our, of the APPI Continuous Professional Development Program, this session qualifies for three structured learning units. And in recognition of National Indigenous Peoples Day and Treaty Number no. 8 Day and APPI's commitment to truth and reconciliation, we are very excited to share the Fort Mackay First Nation story of experiences and success in collaboration and successful community planning. I'm very happy, and it is my pleasure to invite Councillor Ray Powder to share the opening prayer. Councillor Powder was elected his sixth consecutive council term in 2019, and in one more year will have served as an elected member of council for two decades. He's a powerful advocate for education, Moose Lake health and economic opportunity. On behalf of the members, and I am very happy to ask Councillor Raymond to open us up with a prayer. Good morning, Glynis, can you hear me? Okay, great. First of all, Glynis and Mike, thank you for collaborating with Fort Mackay First Nation and uh, Chief Mel. I'd like to say um, thank you for uh, consenting your blessings to this presentation to the public on uh, who we are as Fort Mackay First Nation. So I want to acknowledge that. And uh, Chris Johnson, thank you for uh, contributing also with your staff member as a CEO of Fort Mackay First Nation. So just before I start off in the prayer, I just want to say um, thank you, uh, first of all, for allowing me to say the prayer. And I'm very grateful and thankful. And I uh, just wanted to give thanks to Fort Mackay First Nation, Glenn is your team there and all that. And um, we'll uh, start off with a prayer. And um, usually we um, stand in this as part of the protocol. So if um, I can ask um, everyone, wherever you're seated, whether it be at the office or your residence or whatever work environment you're at, if we can just all rise and we can say a prayer if you don't mind. Thank you so kindly, appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm gonna say a prayer um, my, to, uh, on behalf of my auntie, um, Clara Mercer, and it was a year ago that she passed, and she was really a strong advocate for uh, education and uh, linguistics, and her name is Clara Mercer. So when I say this prayer, it's it's a prayer that she left us behind, and I just want to share that with you today, and then I will be translating that, um, first of all, from Cree to uh, English. So I will start off with the language of Cree, and we are Dene and Cree people of Fort Mackay. And so I want to acknowledge that and also um, the fact that we're in Treaty 8 territory. So thank you so kindly. I'll just uh, bow our hearts and our, our heads and wherever we're at. Thank you so kindly. Kutigak Aisinok Utaski. We Jihinan that dogisagal de Mio de Matsiak. Meanan Aisiwen the Sagi Duyak in what the Manaji Duyak. The Mamu at Duskat the Mag. Nahi Pewen in Daisinimak Ujioti Gigan. Kia Oksisi Mantu Sugatsu. Kua Samana Astani Gonman in Askuntanan. So we nan gaki o sinuak, I sinuk uta atuskito, igua a mamo atuskito. Ugio xisi, dinanas kuntanan, a semina. Heavenly Father, God of creation, God Almighty, we really thank you for this day. 
we thank you and we just ask that you keep us we are your children and all other people here on earth help us every day to live a good life give us wisdom to love one another and to respect one another to work together for the betterment of our people today and also in the future please bless this meeting and bless our participants and thank you for the workers that are here we want to give you an acknowledgement and say thank you Hi, hi. Amen. Hi, hi, Councillor Ray. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Glynis, and thank you, Chief and Council, and uh, Mike, yourself, and Glynis. Thank you. And the <clears throat> Chief looks like he's having a nice coffee. I wish I had some, <laughs> but I don't have coffee. I wish I had some tea. <laughs> nice to have it. Yes. Okay. Um, so again, thank you, Councillor Ray. Yes, it would have been in honor of National Indigenous Peoples Day and Treaty Number Eight Day. We're so excited, and we look forward to this presentation. I now have the pleasure of introducing Chief Mel Granjam of the Fort Mackay First Nation to share with us his opening remarks. Uh, Mel Chief Mel Granjam was elected Chief of Fort Mackay First Nation on April 5, 2019. Prior to serving the nation, Chief Granjam worked in the construction industry for 30 years, earning professional designations in building construction, engineering technology, and project management from the North, uh, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. As a volunteer, he founded the Awake Cultural Camp series that te teaches traditional lifestyle, lifestyle skills like hunting, fishing, and shopping for youth. He's also been a very successful hockey coach. Since taking office, Chief Granjam has, is, has been a fierce advocate for the protection of treaty rights of the members who elected him and all member nations of Treaty 8. He presided over the most important court victory won by a First Nation in Alberta's history that was delivered by the Alberta Court of Appeals in April 2020. Thank you, Chief, Chief, Chief Granjam. I'll uh, pass it over to you for opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jan. Glennis. Well, for one, thank you to Council Ray for starting off with the morning prayer. In council meeting, one of the things we, we always do is start off uh, with morning prayer and our council prayer and uh, bring us good thoughts for, for a well thought out day. I want to thank you for the introduction and and for the invitation for the APPI to present at the continuing education session this morning. I understand this is the first time API has had a First Nation share with your members its experiences as order of government responsibility. Sorry, my, my, my computer is beeping on me here. <laughs> oh my goodness. We too are excited to share uh, Fort Mackay's story, and I'm very pleased to you've had over 200 registrants for this event. Glenn mm has -hmm. noted in her opening remarks that APA chose to offer this event to recognize National Indigenous People Day, which was yesterday, and APA's commitment to truth and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very heartfelt. Um, I'm glad that uh, Canada and the uh, Everyone's taken that into consideration. The past month following the discovery of Kamloops 215 has been challenging time for Canada's First Nation, Métis and Inuit people, as well as compassionate mainstream Canadians. This horrific discovery has forced all of us to confront once again the, the impact of Canada's historical policy toward our people and legacy of residential schools. Fort Mackay will not be celebrating Canada Day this year. On July 1st, we will hold a community event to mark the discovery of Mark Graves holding 250 Indigenous children at the site of former residential school. Uh, that's, that's very touching, and I'm sorry that uh, it, it's hard to, 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 to talk about that without, without feeling it, you know. <laughs> it's tough, so I apologize for the bit of a delay. Our nation continues to work and reclaim and revitalize all that defines us as Korean Denny people. Even as we grieve and support our members who contend with persistent residential impact of residential schools. 
On July 1st, we will gather as a community to reflect and to renew our hope, truth, healing, and reconciliation. At the relaunch of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Governor McHale said, when the present does not recognize the wrongs of the past, the future takes its revenge. That you, that you have chosen to be here this morning suggests that you have perhaps an emerging, perhaps a lasting interest in learning more about indigenous people and being an agent of truth and reconciliation. At Fort Mackay, we are very proud of what we've achieved and sometimes in the face of daunting circumstances. Beginning with the collapse of the fur trade and our traditional economy, our leadership began to explore economic development, opportunities for our nation here in the oil sands. And it was uh, a very pivotal time for our community as we uh, came out of the trapping season. And just a footnote here, um, when the Europeans discovered the fur ban, uh, the trapping economy went really bad. and. Uh, and thus we were in the middle of the tar sands and, and we had to, to sustain or had to get another economy. So it was a, it was a bit of a trade-off. Business development has enabled us to do much of our own members that is beyond the reach of our First Nations who haven't been as successful building nation-based business and revenue generators. We've been able to build some first-class facilities that are un, unraveled to anywhere. But it's equally important to our members that we not lose our connection to the land, language, culture that our ancestors have passed on to us. Our treaty rights are the foundation of our relationship with Canada. Recognizing, affirming, and respecting those rights is essential to reconciliation. Our relationship with the land is the foundation of our identity as Cree and Dene people. With the land and the waters, with the fish, the animals, the trees, the stones, the wind, those are all our relations and we give each other respect and, and it's very important. That's why protecting Moose Lake Reserve was so important for our community. Why the Alberta Court of Appeal decision to overturn the approval of the Old Sands project was a landmark judgment. And why Alberta's adoption of a Moose Lake Access Management Plan that supports the exercise of treaty rights is unprecedented in Alberta. You'll hear more during the presentation about my community, our ambitions, and the way we change the conversation with Alberta and industry to protect Moose Lake. I hope you find it educational and entertaining that you take away something from the session and to guide you in your capacity as planners in the future wherever your work requires collaboration with First Nations. This uh, presentation you will see has been very well put together by Mr. Evans. Um, you have a very good hands also. You have Councillor Ray, who like you said, has 20 years of, of government uh, experience working for our nation. Um, I will, I'm in the middle of a couple of meetings, so I may have to, uh, to sip out, but I will be more, more happy to answer any questions you may have and uh, as the session continues. Glennis, thank you again. And uh, those are my words and uh, thank you very much for that. Hey, hey Chief. Chief, and our hearts that go out to those young kids and we know that there's gonna be more, more found as, as uh, we move forward. I'd also like to introduce Chris Johnson. He's the Chief uh, Executive Officer of Fort Mackay First Nation. He's, um, he will be assisting us uh, when we are um, on the question and answer session uh, after um, Mike's presentation. Uh, so I'm happy to share that we have over, as Chief Mel mentioned, um, we have over 200 um, regist registrants from all over Canada who have joined us today. So with that, I am going to, um, I'm gonna, uh, hand it over to Mike, Mike Evans. He is the Director of Government Relations for the Fort Mackay First Nations for the past three years. And he will now make a two-part presentation to us on the land use planning of Fort Mackay First Nation, both for the hamlet where members live and Mackay's Moose Lake Reserves, which the nation has fought for over 20 years to protect from encroachment of the oil sands industry. So 
Go ahead, Mike. Thank you very much, Glennis. Uh, thank you, Chief Granjam, Councillor Powder, and thanks to all of you folks who've chosen to share your time with us here this morning. Uh, this slide includes the, the motto of the Fort Mackay First Nation, which I think uh, is a fine expression of the community's efforts to bridge the past and the future together, um, recognizing both where it comes from and where it is headed. And in Chief Granjam's remarks, he referenced in particular how important it is to the nation to be able to protect its treaty rights, its inherent rights. And I wanted to begin there with you this morning, just because uh, speaking for myself as a young man who thought I was reasonably well informed, um, I discovered when I did some teaching for the University of Alberta and off-campus credit courses in Northern Alberta, mostly to First Nations and Métis students, that I actually knew very little about life as it is lived by Indigenous peoples in the North, and uh, certainly very little about what constitutes rights, although we hear about that all of the time. So, Indigenous title and rights were acknowledged initially in the Royal Proclamation signed by King George in October of 1763. This quote from that document says, any lands, whatever, which not having been ceded to or purchased by us aforesaid, are reserved to the said Indians. Indigenous title is different from Western concepts of property ownership. It is a unique communally held property right that reflects Indigenous attitudes about land and resources, which Indigenous people include among all our relations, and is fundamentally different then from private ownership. Just as a note for you quickly, uh, Indigenous is supplanting Aboriginal as the preferred term, and uh, the, the language continues to evolve, but for those of you uh, who, who wonder how that's transpiring, that is, is moving along. Canada has 11 numbered treaties with the Crown. You'll note that they begin in Ontario, that there are no treaties in Quebec, Newfoundland. Uh, I don't think there are any in well, it looks like Prince Edward Island is, is included there. Um, Fort Mackay is part of the Treaty 8 group that was signed in 1899. Rights, Indigenous rights, are affirmed in the Constitution at Section 35. Um, I'm not going to read this specifically at this moment for you, except to, to reference that for you. This section of the Constitution, the Royal Proclamation, and each of the numbered treaties tend to, to shape the legal framework whenever there are questions between First Nations, uh, other orders of government and or industry in terms of what are the rights of First Nations peoples to consultation, to mitigation, to accommodation when those rights are infringed upon. It is the courts as I said, that interpret and enforce those rights and title. Um, in particular, the Supreme Court has delivered decisions that establish case law that now also underlies the uh, conception and interpretation of Indigenous rights and title. Much in the way that Indigenous title is communal, Indigenous and treaty rights are collective and inherent rights that flow from the continued use and occupation of specific lands by distinct indigenous communities prior to European contact. For that reason, First Nations across the country reject a pan-indigenous approach or a pan-indigenous identity. Uh, First Nations peoples are profoundly place-based, their languages are profoundly place-based, and that reflects as well uh, a profound and spiritual connection with the land that they occupy. So uh, everything arises from that relationship with the land and, and that location, um, that specific location where a particular First Nation is uh, located. Now, rights, it is important, include the right to consultation whenever rights may be impacted you would have heard of consultation in context of the Trans Mountain Pipeline um, and, and other times in which um, there's a 
conflict that occurs between the mainstream Canadians or their government and Indigenous peoples. Consultation triggers, those, those things that, uh, that require that consultation be undertaken with affected First Nations can include land use decisions, regulatory projects, approvals, licensing, permitting, uh, operational decisions that could have an impact on the landscape, policy development at the federal level, or any other decision or action that could have an adverse effect on existing or potential rights as they are undertaken by either the federal or provincial governments, and those things will trigger the duty to consult. In the case of federally and provincially regulated resource development, Canada and Alberta both assign the duty to consult to the proponent. So it will be, in the case of the oil sands, an oil sands company that undertakes that consultation with Fort Mackay. Uh, a quick review of perspectives here will help you to understand some of the conversations that are ongoing between First Nations and the federal and provincial governments. The government's perspective is that the Crown recognizes and protects rights, land rights, and owes a duty to consult Indigenous peoples whenever an activity may infringe upon those rights or on Indigenous title. This should include rights to the land, subsistence resources, self-determination and self-government, and the right to practice one's own culture and customs, including language and religion. In Alberta, the government tends to focus on hunting, fishing, and trapping, which are explicitly mentioned in the treaty, uh, without necessarily having the next level understanding, which is that those specific quantifiable activities are in fact expressions of a way of life. They are expressions of a relationship with the land. And so that sometimes is the challenge that First Nations encounter when dealing with Alberta. The courts have said that rights may evolve, that is, from uh, net or spear fishing, which would have been the, the technique prior to European contact, up to the use of high-tech fishing equipment and power boats that are developed on, a, on an annual basis, uh, annual basis, a regular basis. So rights can evolve, uh, and that's an important legal perspective. From the First Nations perspective, rights include responsibilities to family, land, environment, the flora and fauna, and a right to the preservation and transmission of culture and customs, including language and beliefs, to successive generations. This is a holistic, as I said earlier, relational approach to being with which government institutions and Western science struggle because they tend to atomize creation into discrete, disconnected components. As I said a moment ago, hunting, fishing, and trapping Gathering medicinal and food plants are not just subsistence rights. These are essential to the preservation of a traditional way of life that is millennia old and an expression of First Nations relationship with the land. The goal of consultation then is to protect First Nations rights and interests, mitigate adverse impacts on those rights, and when they cannot be mitigated, to accommodate the affected First Nation or nations. Municipalities and First Nations are um, in a state of uh, an evolving relationship now, you could say, from coast to coast. The three constitutionally recognized orders of government are federal, provincial, and First Nations. Municipalities, despite their often larger populations and budgets, are creatures of the province. And so evolving case law, much of which has begun to be argued and was begun to be argued in British Columbia, uh, but is now moving across the country, suggests that municipalities are in fact a subordinate order of government to First Nations under the constitution, but that they still retain crown obligations within their jurisdiction as creatures of the province. So municipalities are only now beginning to recognize that they too have obligations to First Nations um, in, in large urban centers that would tend to extend perhaps to neighboring First Nations, such as in Edmonton uh, with the Enoch Cree to the west. But the trick there also becomes in the case of a municipal project that may have an impact on rights, is a municipality a proponent, is a municipality a government? The question remains open. Fort Mackay believes that consultation obligations related to the taking up of land as it is described in Treaty 8, 
are not fulfilled when land is transferred from the province to a municipality. And so the conversation needs to carry on between the First Nation and the municipality that assumes jurisdiction over those lands. And as I said, this is an evolving area of Indigenous relations. Meaningful consultation, uh, the last of these slides, introductory slides, I'll just read this to you from Justice Eleanor jo Dawson and a decision rendered in 2017. Meaningful consultation is not just a process of exchanging information. Meaningful consultation entails testing and being prepared to amend policy proposals in the light of information received and providing feedback. Where deep consultation is required, a dialogue must ensue that leads to a demonstrably serious consideration of accommodation. And now, community planning in the hamlet of Fort Mackay. The first question that some of you may be asking, and certainly some of our uh, registrants from across the country, is where is Fort Mackay? So you can see from these two maps that Fort McMurray is roughly 450 kilometers north and slightly east of Edmonton. Fort Mackay is roughly 55 kilometers north and slightly west of Fort McMurray. In this particular map, those brown areas that you can see on the landscape represent oil sands mining projects that uh, surround Fort Mackay on three sides. As I had said earlier, Fort Mackay is a signatory to Treaty 8, which was signed in 1899 by the chiefs and headmen of the First Nations across Northern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan British Columbia, and West Territories within the Crown. With respect to the reserve lands, uh, which are have been given to most First Nations across the country as part of the treaty signing process, the Indian Act says, subject to this act, reserves are held by Her Majesty for the use and benefit of the respective bands for which they were set apart. In other words, reserve lands are held in trust by the federal government, but Fort Mackay is the sole independent and sovereign authority on its reserve lands with respect to land use. The other important uh, um, reserve that we're going to be talking about today is the Moose Lake Reserve, which is to the north and west of Fort Mackay. So you can see down here, this is the Fort Mackay Reserve. The hamlet is located here with this red pin drop. There are also reserve lands across the Athabasca River. We also have two reserves over here on the other side, um, which are right in the heart of oil sands development. And so the community is in the process of exploring whether or not it can create a viable oil sands project there in partnership with one of the major developers to be able to uh, uh, provide an additional source of ongoing revenue. The Moose Lake reserves over here are in what is for the present relatively undisturbed territory and um, that has been the motivation for why we've been working hard to protect them for the last 20 years. Reserve 174, the hamlet, is on the banks of the Athabasca River, as I said, just north of Fort McMurray. There are approximately 900 members of the Fort Mackay First Nation, and about 500 of those live in the community of Fort Mackay. We share a border with the Fort Mackay Metis community, whose hamlet is under municipal jurisdiction, and together we call Fort Mackay home. Uh, we are also working on some additions to reserve through a treaty land entitlement to be completed in 2021 in part because of the unique circumstances that surround the creation of the Fort Mackay Reserve. This is the community from the air. Uh, as you can see, it's uh, um, in the middle of a little bit of the boreal forest all the way around it. This is the Mackay River down here. Over here, however, you can see the uh, CNRL developments and just back here is the Syncrude projects. So quite a lot of quite close oil sands development to the community. As Chief had said earlier, talking about the shift from a traditional economy into uh, partnership with, with the oil sands industry, our nation-owned companies, properties and partnerships all support responsible economic, industrial and social development. Our business portfolio supports the health of our nation and our people. 
Fort Mackay's group of companies, the first of which was founded in 1986, have increased their annual revenues between 1999 and 2018 just over 80 times. The group currently employs over 1,400 Albertans, which you'll note is larger than the entire population of the nation. And over the period 2018-2014, uh, we've made significant contributions to the federal government through taxes, uh, CPP and EI, significantly larger than any federal grants that we would receive as a First Nation. What that income has enabled us to do is to be able to provide services to the community, as was said earlier, that, that some First Nations cannot uh, do to the same degree. We have a significant building, the Fort Mackay Business Center, which is where the, the nation's administration is located with a large common area that we use for public events. There's a Fort Mackay Youth Center, Fort Mackay Daycare. Fort Mackay has its own arena and hosts annual hockey schools from Marc Messier and from Ted Nolan and his two sons every, every year, uh, COVID accepting, of course. Fort Mackay has its own industrial park. We have uh, continuing care center that was only recently opened. Um, this is a state-of-the-art facility with, with 12 rooms to accommodate seniors, uh, one palliative care suite, and uh, three of those rooms are dedicated to couples. Um, it's really something. If you ever get a chance to come up north and, and visit us, you should have a look at that. We've also got a health center on site that's, that's in part of the business center. Whoop, that was interesting. Very sensitive buttons. We're especially proud as well that we're in the midst of building a brand new school, the Elsie Fabian School. The architecture of the school has been profoundly influenced by uh, First Nations aesthetics, and um, there are going to be dedicated Dene and Cree learning centers as part of the school, as well as the, the latest technology to help our students from a remote location access all of the extra educational services that are now online. Um, the school is currently under construction and we're looking forward to its opening soon. Municipal services in the community are, are provided through the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, of which Fort McMurray is the urban center, uh, paid by Indigenous Services Canada and then delivered in the hamlet. So that would be such things as water, wastewater, uh, solid waste collection, etc. Uh, some road maintenance, the municipality built the bridge here that provides access to the community. However, uh, as I said, sort of alluded to at the beginning, we've also got a few kind of municipal hiccups that we're working out now um, that would be, some are unique to us, others are, are certainly not and would be common to First Nations elsewhere. So if you're working doing planning activities with either the province or in this case, especially municipalities, uh, you would want to know something about this. Fort Mackay's got a slightly unusual land configuration due to our slightly unusual history. Uh, the farther north you go in Canada, the longer that Indigenous peoples have held on to traditional lifestyles. And as Chief said earlier, folks in Fort Mackay were still trapping furs up until the mid to early 80s, uh, early to mid 80s as uh, the primary means of income prior to the expansion of oil sands, which meant that folks were living in the bush. However, when the Indian agents arrived and said that they were going to take their children to school, folks had heard enough about um, uh, experiences, children's experiences in Fort Chippewan and in Lac La Biche that they persuaded the Indian agent to build a school at the location of the Hudson's Bay Trading Post at Fort Mackay. And then in order to be able to have that school actually function as a day school, people moved into the community and took up residence. Um, that means then that the reserve at Fort Mackay, where people actually lived, was created after people already lived there. The, Fort Mac uh, the Moose Lake Reserves were the first reserves. So we have run into some uh, jurisdictional issues, if you will, with the regional municipality that have mostly to do with misunderstandings and we're working on resolving those as quickly as we can. However, I think it's important to assert that reserve lands are protected by statute and First Nations cannot relinquish their sovereignty through agreements with municipalities or others. The second bullet there comes from our 
lawyer who represented us in the Moose Lake case who has said, you cannot negotiate rights except to negotiate them away. So that changes the conversation, if you will, between uh, First Nations and municipalities, uh, the province and, and industry. It's, it's important that folks together come to that understanding. For Fort Mackay, I just have this map here for illustrative purposes. As I've said, uh, the, the reserves were created late where people lived, but that also has meant that there are these remnant properties in other colors right inside the reserve, the yellow, the blue, and at a later date, some of these other properties um, that are actually underneath the jurisdiction of the municipality rather than the nation, even though they are right on reserve. We are in the process through a treaty land entitlement, um, getting these added to reserve and hope to have that concluded by the end of 2021. But this has been a process itself that has been ongoing for almost 15 years. And um, uh, what's particularly, sorry, I'm jumping one slide. So we'll stay here for one second. There is a bit of a legal double, double blind, that double bind rather, that uh, creates some challenges here, both for us and for the municipality and for the province, which is that Alberta's Land Titles Act does not recognize First Nations as legal corporations who can own land. Um, First Nations, as far as quote unquote ownership is concerned, can own only reserve lands, which are held in trust by the federal crown. In order to acquire those parcels that were identified for addition to reserve, Fort Mackay had to transfer title to a corporate entity that was recognized by Alberta, which means in this case, the two wholly owned subsidiary companies in the Fort Mackay group of companies hold those lands indicated in the previous two maps in trust pending completion of the ATR, after which time they will be part of the reserve. Oddly, because they are owned by for-profit entities, right now the regional municipality taxes those properties, and uh, that would include such things as our youth shelter, our elders center, the health center, the daycare, the continuing care center, even our cemetery, which must be the only cemetery taxed in Alberta. Um, those things are taxed by the municipality on the basis of their uh, potential or latent value as if they were private properties to be used for some other purpose. And between 2019 and 2020, the municipality increased taxes on those properties by more than 2,100%. So we are discussing how to resolve that issue right now. Um, this is just again to, to illustrate some of these properties, none of which would be eligible to be taxed within a municipality. Um, are being taxed by the municipality because they are municipal lands inside of our reserve. Another issue where we're having some uh, ongoing negotiations with the province is with the RMWB's land use bylaw. So all of this pink land on the left is the municipal territory that's in proximity to our reserves, which is this area in the white. Um, and, and until this past year, this all had one single rural land use classification. In the updating of its bylaw, which is something the municipality did need to do, it has come up with a number of new classifications for land within this portion here, which is the uh, neighboring Métis portion of the hamlet. However, there wasn't very much conversation between the municipality and the nation about what the impact might be of land use qualifications here on this side, on the reserve, which is right next door. We're working some of that out now, um, but there was not a formal consultation, which Fort Mackay believes is required because these are land use decisions, notwithstanding the fact the land had been transferred from the province to the municipality. And so we are uh, working on a protocol agreement and other initiatives to ensure that that gets dealt with appropriately. We also have a new municipal development plan that's being developed by the regional municipality that uh, we need to be part of and we need to be in much deeper consultation with them as it is developed. Fort, Mac Fort McMurray in particular has had to adjust its um, long-term plans and expectations in 2008 
it adopted a, a municipal development plan that projected a population up to 230,000 people. Uh, it was mostly an aspirational plan. Um, the current population, including 30 to 40,000 people in fly-in, fly-out work camp accommodations, is about 120,000, and that is unlikely to grow by any appreciable amount in any short term. Um, the industry is fully mature. There are no significant projects under construction, so there will not be a driver for new population, and that's why they are uh, doing a new plan. That brings us, I guess, to the end of a um, context, if you will, about what's happening in Fort Mackay and how we work with the municipality. And if there are questions from any of the participants out there, we'll do our best to answer those now. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Every time I get to learn about Fort Mackay, I learn more. Thank you very much. So with the Q&A portion, I'll just go through a bit of um, some logistics on it. Um, <clears throat> so with that, our APPA administration team, they'll moderate the questions and relay them to the panelists. Um, uh, so, and so I may paraphrase what your, your questions say, and, um, and, but we'll take as, uh, we're going, going to take as many questions from a wide variety of people as much as possible. Um, not all questions may be relayed due to time constraints. Uh, while administration will see the name of the individual who poses a question or comment, no names will be shared on air. To ask a question, uh, so just quickly go through the instructions. Please use the go to our web webinar question box. The question box is located in the drop down menu in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Uh, below, uh, when you click on it, you'll see file, view, and help on the top line. Below and just to the left is an orange arrow. Click in the arrow will reveal subtabs, select the question tab, uh, below the audio tab and type your question <laughs> space provided. So thank you uh, for the very informative presentation. Um, and I know that there's gonna be tons of questions um, from the audience. Um, and so I will start to take uh, the okay. questions. Thanks, Glynis, um, for going through the housekeeping. I'm just going to switch you over now to presenters so that you can access that questions box. There's a few rolling in here. Okay. Ooh, you're going to get uh, a little tab asking to take over, and you just select it yes. Okay. Oh, how do I see that? Uh, did I see it? So now you should be able to open up. You should have the option to drop down that questions box. It would be in your control panel. In my question. Sorry, everybody. I figured this out the day before. Um, um, oh, so which one? Show screen? Uh, no questions you're looking for. I don't see a question. I only see chat. Uh, no problem. How about I? Sure. Why don't you take over and tell I? Yeah, you keep digging and I'll just get started. So, um, so far the only comments in are just asking if there will be copies of the presentation. So instead of, uh, you know, distributing copies of Mike's presentation, this session is recorded and it'll be on the APPI YouTube channel to view. Um, I'll also send a link to the recording uh, in the follow-up email after this session. So you'll all have access to, you know, not only see the slides, but um, you know, hear Mike's description as well. I'm um, going through it, and that that'll be up um, very quickly. So I, the first, I could you see the questions now. Okay, great. Yep. So uh, we're on we're on question number four. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Yeah. So um, can so Mike, can you further just discuss the housing component component of land use planning in Port Mackay? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. this, this is this is this is uh, uh, you know one of the issues. We we don't have a an in-house planner. Um, we do have a division that manages our capital projects. So folks who are responsible for um, water, wastewater, 
delivery within what's provided by the municipality uh, who, who manage the, the roads and the households, in fact, um, as well as all of our communal buildings. Um, uh, Fort Mackay is in a different circumstance again than many First Nations, um, having generated a fair amount of its own revenues that housing is not as constrained as it is on so many First Nations communities. I, I think that if you were to ask about what the the really pressing issues in First Nations across Canada, uh, obviously they relate to those places that do not have clean drinking water. Uh, clean drinking water should be a fundamental right in in Canada that is is beyond question. Uh, but the other challenge for many communities is adequate housing. Um, houses are often built according to plans that were developed by uh, what was then called um, Indian and Northern Affairs back in the 50s and 60s, and um, um, work projects to get folks certified as, as carpenters every summer often will have the goal of building three or four houses while people work toward getting their trade certification just to provide more homes for people. But it, it is really common for multiple generations to live in homes that are too, too small. Um, in Fort Mackay, we're able to do better than that. You will have seen from the aerial photographs that there's some uh, houses in Fort Mackay that would look like what you would expect to see in a modern subdivision in an urban center. Um, they're spread out a little bit more. People like to have a little bit more space in, in, uh, on reserve than having somebody just uh, seven or eight feet to the left and right of them. Um, but we will work with um, consulting engineering firms to make sure that we're able to manage uh, service issues and grade issues to build new homes when required. And if there was something more specific that you were looking for, and you can put that in the question box. I'll see if I can address it, but I can't make any promises. That was great, Mike. Um, <clears throat> so can you, uh, Mike, can you clarify the size of range of land serving the Fort Mackay Métis Group within the Hamlet area? The size of the land? Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, size or range. Um, it must be like hectares or something like that, I'm assuming. Yeah, they... you know, I, I actually, uh, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, that was not something that I, I thought to, to look up before we got here. Um, what's an interesting situation with the Fort Mackay Métis, which again is, is different than um, for a lot of Métis communities, much of that land was once held by the province and they sold um, a very significant portion. I mean, it's, it's certainly bigger than the hamlet, the First Nations hamlet side. They sold it as fee simple land to the Fort Mackay Métis Community Association. So they actually own land on which they can grow and develop their community. It's still under municipal jurisdiction in terms of zoning, which is why the land use bylaw applies. Um, but they own that land. And um, as, as a collective. That, as far as I know, is a unique situation in Alberta among uh, Métis communities in northern Alberta, with the exception of the Métis settlements, which a lot of people don't know about either. There are eight Métis settlements in Alberta that were created back in the 30s in the wake of the Depression. Um, there are about 6,000 members of the Métis Settlements General Council that are resident on eight different settlements. There are about 65,000 Métis people in Alberta, uh, the other 60,000 roughly um, mm. live elsewhere and they don't live on any, you know, they, 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 those are folks who would own a home like anybody else in any other community. There's no such thing as collectively held land for them. So that's where the Fort Mackay Métis are uh, a kind of a, a unique circumstance next door to us. Mm -hmm. Cool, no, awesome. Um, can you, when do you anticipate the um, opening of the um, LC Fabian School on the Northland School Division uh, is the question. So when do you anticipate the impact of the opening of the school? 
Well, I think we're hoping to have it open uh, not for the upcoming school year. That I think would be that's too fast. But for the the next school year, um, the impact of it will be among other things that our kids don't have to jump on the bus to uh, take the 45, 50 minute ride into Fort McMurray to get to school, the kids who do that. We do have an existing school on reserve, but it's small. Uh, it won't serve as many students as this larger school will serve. Um, and we've really worked hard to include a cultural component in the new school to help kids reacquire their, their languages, uh, to have a better understanding of their cultures, and to uh, incorporate that into their ordinary education. Um, it is going, to, because it's an on-reserve school, it is not part of the Northland School Division. This will be an independent school um, operated by Fort Mackay. I, I believe that's the goal for, for its operations. The current school is affiliated with Northlands, um, but the uh, leadership as I understand it, really wanted to establish a, a strong independent school, and I suppose it might have a parallel in urban centers with charter schools. Hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so this person has asked, so when I worked on the initial Fort Hills planning, there was much talk about the abundant oil sands under Fort Mackay and what the band, possibly with Shell, might, might mine it. Were those discussions based on fact? Have those visions disappeared? Underneath the hamlet proper, if that's a question. Um, I, th that was why I spoke to reserves 174 C and D, which are some distance to the east. Um, that is apparently a, a significant oil sands deposit and uh, um, we are currently exploring a means of developing that. As I said, this is in the very early stages. It was announced um, not even a year ago that we were going to pursue that. Um, Alvaro Pinto, who's our CEO of Oil Sands Development and uh, Executive Director of Sustainability, is leading that project. And he himself used to work in the oil sands, so he's got some. Uh, um, meaningful previous professional experience. Mm -hmm. um, but why the community would consent to actually looking for anything underneath the hamlet, I cannot imagine. Um, I'm not aware of there being any SAG-D projects that go underneath Fort McMurray. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know why anybody would want to have something underneath Mackay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, OK, so the next question. So the treaty relationships are with the Crown not the municipality. How does a municipality engage with First Nations appropriately? So this is a couple, there's um, a three-part question actually. So how did they engage yeah, appropriately? Okay. Um, is there hesit hesitancy or was initially in the past for where the, the First Nation to meet directly with the municipality because of the treaty relationship? Um, so we'll go with, there's another part, but we'll go with those that one too, those first two. Um, I'm going to roll back a little bit just to sort of provide a, a kind of a historical context. I was working with the provincial government in the late 90s after that period that I had taught up north. Uh, and then I took a job after that with the tribal council in the Slave Lake area. And the province at the time was trying to look at how it would um, um, handle what this emerging issue to it uh, of dealing with First Nations. And this was just after the National Oil Sands Task Force had made certain um, regulatory and taxation changes to encourage oil sands development. So uh, it was still in its relatively early stages and hadn't had the explosion it did after 2000. At the time, the province's First Nations policy was, we don't want to have anything to do with it. We need to put up a firewall. We've got to push back as hard as we can. This is federal responsibility. And uh, it was largely case law that established that that would not be acceptable. Um, in particular, it was the Mikasu Cree uh, challenge of, I think it was 2006, uh, that resulted in some codification of the consultation policy. So 
municipalities, uh, not necessarily with the same sort of pushback intention, but they've inhabited a similar arena in that I do not think it occurred to most municipalities that they had to deal with First Nations uh, in proximity to their communities because there hadn't been a lot of historical dealing. Um, what we're working through with the regional municipality right now, in addition to some of the specifics around taxation and uh, municipal service delivery, is a, a protocol agreement that will um, improve our communications with one another, that will support consultation when it's required, and then appropriate action afterward. And I th think that the best way maybe to characterize that is that a proponent or the municipality, and with lots of time too, the, the issue with the land use bylaws that there had not been a lot of conversation beforehand in many ways, municipalities uh, are passive in the way they do their com their community consultation. They let everybody know that there's an opportunity, and then they wait for those who are interested to come forward, uh, which means in a city the size of Edmonton, you know, um, 800, 900,000 people, you, you might get responses on a particular development proposal from 45. Mm -hmm. um, that's not acceptable with a municipality and the First Nation. There's a constitutional obligation to consult on these issues. So you have to, you can't rely upon a five minute presentation during a public hearing. That just isn't uh, sufficient or appropriate. So a municipality should reach out early. And in, in my view, appropriate consultation sort of has three elements. As the proponent, you say, here's what we're thinking about doing. What do you think? You need to collect that input and then go back to the nation and say, here's what we think we heard you say. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. And you get a confirmation there. And then the third part of it should be, here's what we're going to do that responds to what you told us. Mm -hmm. And and that's where the uh, the mitigation accommodation might, might happen as part of that. Um, as part of that consultation. It, it could be simple. Uh, it, it, it likely is not complicated, but in cases where it is complicated, if the engagement happens early, then you can improve the likelihood of coming to a, a, um, an amicable solution relatively easily. Mm -hmm. What was the third part, Linus? You actually answered it. There were other oh, questions. Okay. Where like what are what are tools for engagement towards collaboration? So you talked about you know as a protocol agreement as a mechanism, you know you offered um, you know how municipal municipalities can can um, step up in terms of their reaching out. So so you answered the third like you answered it. Basically. Okay, I mean it really is about having an open dialogue, and it has been my experience in the past. Um, both in Fort Mackay and in other communities where I've worked, where folks from mainstream Canada who don't have a lot of experience uh, with First Nations or other Indigenous communities are a little bit frightened of, of what awaits them once they mm -hmm. open the door. Um, but First Nations are like any other community. You know, they, they want to be um, approached respectfully. Mm -hmm. But that's that's easy. I mean, there's 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 you know there are certain maybe protocols when you're engaging elders that you use some good to learn. Um, there's some background. Does anybody else hear that echo all of a sudden? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, it it has mostly to do with opening the door and then having an honest conversation. Um, because we are talking about rights. People often want to get their lawyers engaged, and, and there may be occasions where that's necessary. Um, but my experience is also that legal counsel tends to make other people clench in a way that isn't helpful. Um, not to mention that this is an emerging area of Canadian jurisprudence. And the First Nations have already hired most of the good lawyers who know anything about Indigenous law. So the ones who are left. Uh, who are advising municipalities really don't have the background to give them good advice. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess the last thing that I would say in that respect for people to think about 
is that even your lawyers are just consultants. Um, we, we tend to take our lawyers' words as gold, and they're not necessarily. You know, uh, a, a lawyer is trained to look for conflict because they get paid in an adversarial system for resolving the conflict. That's not consultation. Um, it should be more collaborative than that. Yes, agreed. So that's, um, thanks Mike, that was really, really good. I'm just taking lots of notes here. Um, so is there, um, re with regard to land code and Fort Pekai, um, is there any, is there a, an update on that with the First Nations Land Management Act? Oh, uh, that's a good question. And, and we really are only exploring the implications of that now. Um, it ties into the treaty land entitlement and the additions to reserve. Um, there will be implications. Um, the, I, I tend to be more involved when the legislation is being developed and then when there's policy that's written to accompany the legislation, the actual implementation of the act and its requirements would fall more to our capital projects people. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm afraid I can't speak to that other than to say that, that yes, I anticipate there will be changes. Part mm -hmm. of that is to increase the autonomy of First Nations um, on their own lands. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that's a good answer. So I guess um, along the same lines, has there been any discussions with creating an urban reserve with Fort Mackay and a municipal district? No, not really. Um, urban reserves, again, are a, um, an emerging concept across the country. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are very many. British not Columbia is different because they 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 didn't have treaties uh, until recently, and so there have been um, negotiations there where different First Nations own significant tracts of developed mm -hmm. urban land. Or it's been so that relationship is different. Um, but no, we haven't looked to create an urban reserve in in Fort McMurray. Fort Chippewan, just for interest's sake, is a different situation. Uh, that community is well over 200 years old, going back to the fur trade. It was one of the uh, uh, um, central hubs to a number of spokes for fur trading in northern Alberta. So it's it, that community has been inhabited by Cree and Dene people, the Miccosu Cree and the Athabasca Chippewan uh, First Nation, as well as a, a large number of Métis folks. And they already live in the village or the hamlet, if you will, of Fort Chippewan with the two reserves flanking the community to the left and right, but the housing is mostly in Fort Chip. And for those two First Nations, because a lot of their members do not live quote unquote on reserve land, then they do not qualify for the federal income tax exemption that is available to First Nations people who work for a First Nation and live on reserve. Um, so that's a long-standing grievance in Fort Chippewan, and Miccosu and Athabasca Chip are both negotiating with the Regional Council of Wood Buffalo um, to consider what I would call the checkerboarding of that community, creating little pockets of quote-unquote reserve land that correspond with people's homes that would allow them then to share in the same rights and privileges of other First Nations people across the country, but that's a complicated solution and I don't know what its status is now. I, that that conversation's been going on for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, even I guess here. Yeah, there are none. There's no urban reserves in Alberta um, to date. Um, I think so it's the next, just Winnipeg, right? Saskatchewan, I know, has some, like Saskatoon. Okay. They have, yeah, they have some too. Um, so, so a large city um, with surrounding counties um, would like to um, develop a, a integrated municipal development plan with the surrounding First Nation. Um, any any thoughts on how to start something like that to work with the nation on you know that municipal development IDP? Um, yeah. So, just any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, uh, uh, you know, that's a relatively new component of the MGA and, and the requirement to do those intermunicipal plans. I, I, I don't know uh, how successful folks have been in, in what I would call the mainstream community. Um, I, I know there's some that have gone well and others that have gone poorly. Um, but yes, if you've got a First Nation in, in close proximity, um, they, and this is purely speculative on my point, uh, my part here now, because I don't know what's happening out there, but they mm -hmm. might, for example, be interested in transit service, which is one of the things that those intermunicipal plans are supposed to coordinate. Um, Fort McMurray does have a transit system that includes Fort Mackay. It obviously doesn't operate on the hour the way it would in the urban center, but there are uh, buses that come out to the reserve that uh, members can take back into town if they don't have a vehicle or don't want to drive a vehicle. They can still get back into town, which is where all of the urban services are. We don't have any grocery stores in Fort Mackay. Um, we don't have a car wash. Limitations on our water system as it's provided by the municipality means we probably, you know, until there's a significant upgrade there, we can't have a car wash. So it, it is important that people be able to get to and from town for all kinds of reasons. Um, and, and that would be something, again, where you could approach a community. Um, I would go first to chief and council and uh, either the CEO or the band manager. They may not be familiar with this um, yeah, the requirement concept. of the provincial government at all mm -hmm. because they operate under federal jurisdiction. And so I would not be surprised if folks had not paid any attention at all. Um, but if you were to approach First Nations and say, this is something we're doing for all of your neighbors, you know, we're all trying to work on this together, um, I would think that you would find some receptivity to exploring at least what is possible. Um, you know, the sharing of recreation facilities is something else that I know people are doing under those plans. So I mm -hmm. cannot imagine that a nation would not be interested in having that conversation with you, especially considering um, that Fort Mackay is very unique in terms of the services we're able to offer our members. Most communities that are less prosperous cannot do what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess as the planner too, um, you know, one of the comments says the discussion isn't happening with the, the nation. Like you, and we both know, Mike. You know, you start then go talk to the nation, <laughs> go ask them what they what they would like to see as part of an IDP, right? As you know, and build and, your and go oh, yeah, go out, go out, open hearted, open handed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was thinking we began the session with a prayer from Councillor. Powder. And one of the things that I really appreciate about First Nations is that every meeting, uh, every gathering starts with a prayer. And whether or not you share one another's faith, um, what's nice about starting a prayer is that the whole goal of that is to, is, is to reorient your thinking to an open hearted perspective. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you come into the room expecting a conflict, you're going to find one. Um, but if you can come into the room with a, a more generous perspective, then you're more likely to be able to solve whatever an issue is as well without having a, a hot conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being really open minded. So it looks like this is um, um, the last question that I'm seeing. So in the past, there were major financial requirements for companies to in uh, oh, to invest and hire Indigenous staff. Hmm. Are those types of agreements still in place? How important are they to Fort Mackay's budget and quality of life? Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, whatever policies are referenced there are policies of the companies, not anything that's imposed by the First Nation or even mm -hmm. by the government. Those are commitments by those policies themselves to acknowledge that they are operating in the backyard of a number of First Nations um, and that therefore as a simple matter of equitability and everybody's doing diversity programming now, but you might consider that some of the stuff that was done up in Wood Buffalo um, was like um, um, foreshadowing or forecasting what was going to happen with diversity. Those are commitments of the company to the communities 
who otherwise would have a lot less opportunity. And I, I think it was Syncrude that that did that first uh, and most aggressively. But it's a it's a policy, a company policy, that's been emulated by the other companies. Uh, how important is that to um, Fort Mackay's revenues? Well, again, in terms of individual employment, um, that's a matter for the individual companies. In terms of procurement of services and what have you, that's really important. Yeah. Um, Fort Mackay's own source revenues are almost entirely from oil sands development and partnerships with oil sands companies to develop deliver services, whether it's uh, logistics or earthworks or, or uh, some environmental services, janitorial, um, working in some of the camps, you know, all of that stuff brings revenue back to the community. We are trying to diversify. Fort Mackay is uh, doing a housing development in Beaumont right now, so that's some distance away, obviously, from Fort Mackay. Um, and we're looking gradually at diversifying the economic portfolio into other areas, but um, um, thank you again, everyone. And uh, one, of, one of the benefits of not being able to see everyone is to be able to comfortably pres uh, presume that we all were able to keep our breaks to 15 minutes. <laughs> um, the second half of this presentation is uh, about the work that Fort Mackay has been doing for two decades to protect its Moose Lake reserves, and in particular, the Moose Lake Access Management Plan that was um, announced by the Provincial Cabinet in February. I wanted to take a moment, and Councillor Powder has sort of been in transit while we've been doing uh, this event here this morning. He has been with us since we started, but I wanted to give him an opportunity to uh, offer some comments about Moose Lake if he's in a position that he can do so at the moment, um, which I, I can't actually tell, sorry. Councillor Powder, are you present? Hello and good okay. morning. We'll bring him back. Oh, there we are. Thank you, Councillor. First of all, um, I'll turn on my camera here. Just give me a second. Hello? Could you see me here? Yep. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Mike and uh, Glynis, for your presentation this morning and uh, on Fort Mackay. I just want to um, backtrack on some of the uh, questions just a little bit first before we go into Moose Lake. Mike, just uh, to let you know that uh, Fort Mackay First Nation is in the process of going through a land code, and uh, I actually am the chairperson on the committee. So I actually sit there. So we're in the process of uh, developing a land code and presenting it uh, for uh, our members for a review and a ratification at the end of the day. And the goal is to actually to have ownership of uh, managing our own lands as far as um, not initially um, going through the whole process of um, going through Indigenous Services Canada, where we can manage our own uh, files and our own decisions in-house which we already do on a semi basis. Excuse me for a little housekeeping. I got to turn that phone on silent. Thank you. <clears throat> and in addition, the other part is that Fort Mackay, I know one of the questions was that if uh, Fort Mackay has um, decided to do some um, urban, um, on the urban communities such as Fort McMurray or Edmonton in that area for, um, developing or becoming a part of that. No, Fort Mackay has not entertained really that question, but we have entertained the idea of collaborating with um, a First Nation just outside of Edmonton called Enoch. And within that collaboration, the outcome would be to uh, create an industrial business park for our companies for logistics on transporting goods, whether it be from the province or right across Canada or globally. So we have uh, had those discussions. We do have a logistics office based out of Edmonton, which we already do that, but uh, we wanted to uh, do something more um, uh, with another First Nation in uh, not only uh, helping them, but also in um, capacity developing each other in whatever area that we may need to, to grow and uh, what we need to identify as our vision, our goals within each First Nation. 
First of all, before we start on the Moose Lake Access Management Plan case study, um, I believe that um, Mike will go through a, a series of slides here. And in those series of slides, there'll be a presentation of who we are and how we be, how we came about on the Moose Lake Access Management Plan. The acronym for that is MLAP, which I uh, maybe you may refer to at times in the in the slide. I'm not sure, but anyways, um, MLAP is a uh, was a big file to Fort Mackay and we started this in 2002 and when we started this in 2002 we um, seen the need to identify that we needed to protect Moose Lake as one of our uh, pristine areas in the boreal forest and also with the lake and also the area and so part of that um, this case study that you're going to be seeing here on the Moose Lake Access Management Plan will be um, presented to you but also presented to you that uh, we provided a lot of uh, history within uh, this area as far as um, um, protecting the area. One of the exercises that Fort Mackay um, went through in 2011 and also another exercise later on in years is that we actually um, did uh, focus groups with our Fort Mackay members whether it be uh, the First Nation, the Métis local or community members and uh, we want to get um, a compass as far as where do we want to go, what do we want to do, what do we want to see with respect to preserving and protecting Moose Lake. Moose Lake is a, an area where um, we hunt and fish and gather and where we um, actually go to, as families every year and uh, we actually um, did, another, did another component in um, exercising uh, getting back on the land and uh, really did a nice uh, program called the cabin program to get people to live more on the land so we actually have people there on the land now which is pretty much um, a full year before it used to be seasonal and all that because it was quite um, the hunting thing and gathering because so people would go there for fishing and then uh, for getting moose and uh, gathering plants and berries and that so uh, Mike, I'll let you take over now, and uh, I'll be available here for comments or questions or support, whatever it needs. Uh, I, I will make myself access available. Thank you, Glennis, also. Thank you, Councillor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so welcome back again, everyone. This uh, second half of our presentation is about the Moose Lake Access Management Plan. Uh, as Councillor Power had said, and as we had advertised. Now that it's strange, the, there we go. Um, a corresponding slide to the first one, which spoke about Fort Mackay's business interests, um, but also important to think of everything that Fort Mackay does inside, in the context of, of its treaty's rights. So. From Chief Grand Gem, Fort Mackay First Nation supports responsible, sustainable development. We have important relationships and benefit agreements with many oil sands developers. However, central to all our activities is the protection of our treaty rights. Pursuit of prosperity does not trump our treaty rights. So as per earlier, we we're answering the question about where is Fort Mackay? The question could be asked, where is Moose Lake? The satellite map depicted in this slide shows in the white outline the Fort Mackay traditional territory. And within that, here are the Fort Mackay uh, reserves 174, where the hamlet is, and 174D uh, uh, B. Uh, 174D and C are over here in the midst of some oil sands development. And as I'd said before, reserves 174A and B, which were the first reserves granted in 18. 99 uh, through the treaty process of 1899 granted in 1915 are up here at Moose and Buffalo Lakes. To many, uh, owing to the history of the community and many of its families, Moose Lake is home uh, in a spiritual sense for sure. Uh, for some people it's beginning to be a, a home in a more literal sense again. They were recognized, the Moose Lake Reserves were recognized from the very beginning as a landscape in which traditional indigenous land uses, cultural practices, ceremony and values could be sustained and passed from generation to generation. So we've relied greatly upon elders uh, to, to keep the culture alive and the oral tradition. 
uh, and to be able to bring that forward to children and their children and, and sustain that cultural connection. The reason that Moose Lake got identified in particular uh, for protection is due to encroaching oil sands development. This first map up at the top here depicts what's happening in the oil sands in 1967. And it's not entirely representative because this light green patch here is Suncor, uh, but the shape file that we have represents its, its current complete development there at, at base. Um, obviously the project in 1967 was quite a bit smaller. By 2020, you can see all of the new mines that have been uh, built up in the area in proximity both to our reserves 174A and the, or sorry 174 and uh, the hamlet and then these reserves here that are surrounded by oil sands development that's the area that I spoke about earlier this morning where Fort Mackay is considering whether or not it can create an oil sands project there and then Moose Lake at some distance there is some SAG D activity that is planned that is moving up in that direction. Uh, number of projects in the area that different companies have in different stages of the preparation to enter into the regulatory uh, application process. And the orange lines are linear disturbance, um, cut lines, uh, seismic lines, roads, pipelines, what have you. So you can see that there's been a tremendous change between 1967 and today, um, over 50 years in, in the region of the traditional territory. This next map indicates all of the areas that are under subsurface lease agreements with the province to oil sands companies. So in addition to this activity that is underway already, 70% of the nation's traditional territory is under lease to oil sands developers. These green areas are uh, parklands. This is Wood Buffalo National Park up here. These are um, provincial, wildland provincial parks. So the reason that there's no development on these is because development is prohibited on provincial parks. One of these, of course, is right beside our Moose Lake Reserves, but there is some legacy seismic activity there from before this park was created. As uh, Councillor Raymond said, uh, Moose Lake is really important to the families in Fort Mackay. Um, folks are out on the water a, a lot. They're in, in, in the woods. This is uh, one of our park rangers, Joe Grandjam, who's teaching some of the younger kids about uh, some of the plants that are harvested and uh, what they can be used for. It's a pretty beautiful place. And here's a quick timeline. I'm not going to go through all of these individually, but as Councillor Powder had said, efforts to protect Moose Lake began in 2002, um, once there were plans to develop the CNRL Horizon North project. And there were a number uh, of touch points, if you will, through here, where we were starting in a positive or green sense of what protection might be possible. Um, but as protection efforts continued to stall and things became more concerning, it moved into amber. And of course, this down here, this red square is important because in February, um, February of 2018, um, an initial draft of the Moose Lake plan or MLAMP was released for public consultation. And four months later, the AER approved the Prosper Rigel project which was in very close proximity to the Fort Mackay reserves. The initial attempts to protect Fort Mackay included the following. Uh, beginning back in 2002, 2003, Fort Mackay began discussing uh, the encroachment of oil sands operations with Alberta with a view to trying to, to develop some sort of protection mechanism. In 2008, the province discontinued those conversations uh, and said that it would address the issue through the development of the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, which was finalized in 2012. Uh, none of the suggestions that the community made to the government appeared in LARP. Those parks that I mentioned a moment ago were identified as possibilities. Um, but only after industry had relinquished its interest in those territories, they were not in the end declared until 2018. 
In 2013, the Alberta Energy Regulator approved the Dover project, which was that dark green SAG D project that I indicated beneath the Moose Lake reserves. Um, but they, they got quite close to the reserves. And so it became even more imperative at that time when the community recognized that uh, the industry was in fact moving northward to try to find some enhanced protection for Moose Lake. Also in 2015, disappointed with the results of the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan, Port Mackay joined with nine other communities uh, to request that an expert review panel be struck underneath the Alberta Land Stewardship Act to review LARP and to determine whether or not it had done uh, the job that it was required to do in terms of protecting treaty rights. The report that was tabled by that panel in 2016 said that LARP in fact did not, that it had failed to address treaty rights, and it also identified Fort Mackay as the First Nation that is most affected by oil sands development. <clears throat> At, after 2013, when the Dover project was approved, uh, Alberta and Fort Mackay began conversations about a 10 kilometer uh, special management zone that would extend, or a special management zone rather, that would extend 10 kilometers out from the Fort Mackay Moose Lake reserves. So this is the larger uh, picture here in the inset, obviously. This is a close up of the reserves. This is the Birch Mountains Wildland Provincial Park that is to the north and west of those reserves. And then this area inside the 10 kilometer zone is referred to as the mixed use zone inside the 10 kilometer zone. And the idea there is that all development that would be permitted inside the entire zone, because there is none that's permitted inside the park, would be um, transferred, if you will, and be allowable with this mixed use zone. So the question then between the province and Fort Mackay became how to manage development inside the mixed use zone so that Fort Mackay's treaty rights can still be exercised. Uh, one more just piece of information for you and you know, with the 10 kilometer zone, again, this is the Birch Mountains Park. This is the mixed use zone. These are leases held by various companies. And the priority issue for Fort Mackay had been that it did not want to have central processing facilities, the, the, the hub heart, the industrial hub of a, a SAGD operation. That's the, the underground operations for those of you unfamiliar with it. The steam assisted gravity drainage involves drilling pairs of wells, injecting high temperature, high pressure steam into the ground to melt the bitumen to enable it to be uh, brought up the other well more easily. And, and these are the well pads that get drilled at a distance and then the, the product is piped back to the central facility. Of these leases inside the 10 kilometer zone, three of them, these two in brown, which were held by the Prosper Company, about which we'll speak a little bit more uh, later on, and this blue one, which is CNRL, are entirely within the 10 kilometer zone. So the communities um, hope, wish that a central processing facility would not be located anywhere inside the 10 kilometer zone, could be accommodated by these leases that straddle the border. They can put a, a, a central processing facility here. This light purple is the Petrochina project uh, that's called the called when it was approved the Dover project, and its central processing facility is about here. But Prosper and CNRL would have had no alternative but to put a central processing facility inside the 10-kilometer zone, where the uh, majority of disruption would occur and, and the highest risk in the event of any failure. The third and fourth attempts to get protection for, for Moose Lake started in 2012 underneath the uh, progressive conservative governments of uh, Premier Redford and Premier Prentice, respectively. The government executed letters of intent with Fort Mackay in 2012 and then again in 2015 to try to deal to develop a plan 
and Premier Prentice's letter in 2015 had an expectation that they would develop a Moose Lake plan in six months. Then there was an election, the government changed. Uh, the new NDP government re-engaged with Fort Mackay in 2016 and signed a new collaboration agreement with an intent to develop a plan. It was under that process, the government and Fort Mackay uh, had a um, co-lead representatives that were working with one another to identify what a protective plan would look like. But before that process was complete, uh, as I said earlier, the draft was released in 2018. In now I'm conf I believe it's sorry I said June earlier I think in July, the Alberta Energy Regulator approved the Prosper Rigel project inside the 10 kilometer zone, and Fort Mackay immediately appealed uh, that decision. At that point, the community decided to do something differently that it had never done before in that the previous four attempts to protect Moose Lake had largely come up empty. So at the same time that the appeal was heard in October of 2019, the community launched a comprehensive public and government relations campaign uh, to try to raise the profile of the issue, to, to ensure that Albertans understood what the conversation was genuinely about, and to provide some additional encouragement to the province to resolve the issue. We got lots of earned media in uh, print and broadcast. Um, uh, Chief made a couple of appearances on the Danielle Smith show. We also had a fairly significant social media presence that we used again to promote the, the, the conversation and the need to protect Moose Lake. That initial public relations effort, the, the appeal trial or the appeal hearing rather occurred in October. In the end of January 2020, Fort Mackay hosted the Moose Lake Summit in Edmonton. Uh, we invited ministers Nixon and Wilson to attend, as well as all of the industry stakeholders and a number of indigenous communities. And at the conclusion of that day-long event, Minister Nixon uh, agreed in January to complete MLAMP in a period of 90 days. And he and the chief jointly issued a, a news release with that commitment. In the end, partially due to COVID and other factors, it, it took almost exactly a year, but it was um, a very explicit commitment that we got from the UCP government. My screen has, there we go, frozen. Um, okay, so the 2018 draft plan was called too prescriptive by industry, they said, it provided them with no flexibility to to operate and 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 um, uh, received a lot of negative negative comment. So when we reconvened in 2020, Fort Mackay persuaded Alberta and the stakeholders to adopt an outcome-based planning model, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, Fort Mackay and Alberta Environment and Parks co-hosted a stakeholder working group from February through to the end of April that included oil sands and forestry sectors, players who had um, uh, interests inside the 10 kilometer zone, as well as other indigenous communities who also had traveled to the area to practice traditional land uses. All of the participants in the workshops endorsed the vision, principles and outcomes, more or less. There was some uh, conversation certainly about them, but they were um, identified fairly clearly in order to support that conversation. Then management actions and performance metrics were designed to achieve the outcomes. And those became the most hotly um, uh, contested elements of the plan while it was being developed. And then of course, adaptive management was built into the plan to ensure that whatever management action was being taken, that it tended toward the achievement of outcomes. Sorry, folks, I'm, there we go. Having a little trouble with the screen freezing occasionally. Um, as we moved into that process from February to April, um, the thing that industry often said to everybody about how they wanted the plan to unfold was just tell us what you wanna protect and we'll protect it. Um, 
Industry also said that it did not believe that Moose Lake should be special, which essentially means that it was hoping to conduct business as usual within the 10 kilometer zone with perhaps the addition of protecting discrete elements represented by these little blue circles that were identified by the community. The difficulty with that from the perspective of Fort Mackay is that uh, just protecting these little parts ignores the fact that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and ignores the community's relationship with the land. So this kind of an approach would not have been acceptable to Fort Mackay and we argued quite hard for something else. This is the strategic planning model, the outcome-based model that I referred to two slides ago with the vision, principles, outcomes, management actions, and performance measures. Um, this may look familiar to some of you. I initially learned about this model when I did work with Grant Pearsall at the City of Edmonton to help Edmonton develop its uh, natural areas policy and natural areas network. Uh, this is how we went out to work, especially in our public engagement. Some of the key elements uh, of the model that, that I like in particular is that when you move from the vision through to the outcomes and the performance measures that assess your success on those outcomes, it explains how we are going to do this. How do we implement the vision? We need these principles. Uh, then we identify these outcomes, actions to achieve them, measurements to see if we're being successful. The outcomes very often are identified by issues or risks. Um, so that you can articulate an outcome that would identify an ideal future state in which the risk or the issue was no longer present. And of course, here's the adaptive management feedback loop. Your performance measures indicate whether or not your outcomes are being achieved. And if they're not, um, then you either make changes to the management actions because they are ineffective, or it may be that your performance measures don't indicate progress is the way you thought, or it may be that your outcome needs to be adjusted. So we have that feedback loop of adaptive management built into the Moose Lake plan on this side of it. Uh, there we go. So here was the vision. The Moose Lake Plan will support the exercise of Section 35 rights, which is why we began with rights at the very beginning this morning. Traditional land uses and cultural practices and the transfer of Indigenous knowledge to future generations by members of the Fort Mackay First Nation, Fort Mackay Métis, and other Indigenous peoples with a historical presence in the Moose Lake area. Two, it will sustain the ecological integrity and naturally occurring biodiversity. And three, it will provide opportunity for responsibly managed resource development. The principles, uh, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but I think the one that's most important is this idea of the policy plus principle in that we began to identify outcomes for the 10 kilometer special management zone beginning with existing legislation, regulation, and policy, and then some additional requirements that were necessary in order to achieve the vision. So uh, MLAMP is a outcome-based policy plus plan. And when it is adopted as policy by the government, it then provides direction to regulators, which would include Alberta Environment and Parks under APIA and the Water Act and the Alberta Energy Regulator, uh, for energy projects. We then determined outcomes for each of the following six key elements, land and footprint management, air quality, water and wetlands, fish and wildlife, access management and the Moose Lake Trail, and lastly, governance. Uh, how will the planning model be used as, a, as an evergreen planning tool and also strengthen the relationship between the province and Fort Mackay in the management of the area. This is a little bit abstruse, uh, some of this, but I think it's important to try to get a sense of what it is that we were doing up there and, and what we were confronted with. The entire 10 kilometer zone is a, roughly 103,000 hectares. Of that 103,000 hectares, almost 40,000 hectares are inside the Birch Mountains Wildland Provincial Park, where no development would be permitted. A little less than 8,000 hectares are the reserves, where no development would be permitted. 
re leaving a remaining 56,000 hectares, or just over half, in the mixed use area, which is where development would be permissible. Government then moved to a, a criterion called interior habitat, and the idea was to maintain uh, a certain amount of interior habitat intact to minimize the impact on the ecosystem inside the 10 kilometer zone. So the target overall was to maintain 85% of the entire 10 kilometer zone intact as a, a measurement that would show that it could sustain the exercise of treaty rights and traditional land uses. Currently, 90, just less than 95% of the park is intact. The reserves are 90% intact. There is a development along the shoreline uh, inside the reserves, which is, is part of the, the community. And the mixed use area was just 80% intact, so already below the 85% target. The idea then was that all development would occur inside the mixed use zone that would enable the entire 10 kilometer zone to have a intact interior habitat of 85%. Well, my apologies. What that means then, again, is that of the 103,000 hectares, there should be just less than 90% of intact interior habitat that's present on the landscape now which is 86.5% for the whole entire area, which um, corresponds to a buffered footprint of just less than 14,000 hectares or 13.5%. Here's our target of 85, which would allow, uh, which would require 88% uh, in 88,000 intact hectares with 15,000 in buffered footprint. That would allow for a 15% disturbance or an 85% intactness in the entire 100% of the whole 10 kilometer zone. And as I mentioned, this allowable footprint of 15,000 hectares uh, could be concentrated in the mixed use zone. From there, government allocated uh, a certain amount of disturbance to different industrial sectors, which is what they were entitled to individually up to the aggregate total of 15,000. Now, industry initially objected pretty strongly to any notion of an interior internal ha interior habitat uh, disturbance limits and reclamation criteria because they were concerned that that would effectively sterilize bitumen, which the industry, of course, um, would, would be unhappy with. So again, to repeat, it's easier to think of in terms of these diagrams than the charts. The goal is to keep 85% of the landscape intact the area is currently 86.5% intact, which means that industry, all of the industrial sectors, are permitted from the current disturbance, a further disturbance of 1.5%. All development features were calculated with a buffer to account for their broader environmental impact. For those of, so for those of you who, who do work in um, ecosystems, you would, you would be aware of this. It's something they call the edge effect. But the idea is that the impact of a particular feature is not restricted to its specific footprint, but that the footprint, if you will, reverberates into the surrounding area. So in these two diagrams, what you have is the actual infrastructure element, a buffer indicated of 50 meters and a buffer indicated of 200 meters. In, on the landscape, in oil sands development, SAGD development inside the 10 kilometer zone, this would be your central processing facility. Uh, that's the whole footprint of it with a 50 meter and 200 meter buffer. These lines branching off are the pipelines to the different well pads where activity would be undertaken. And the buffer shows the intersecting area, total area of calculated disturbance. In effect, what that means is that interior habitat becomes a biophysical proxy both for the exercise of treaty rights uh, and for the, the uh, and traditional land uses and for the condition of the landscape. What this also meant that was fairly important um, is that because only one and a half percent 
could be disturbed in addition to existing disturbance is that the reclamation of existing legacy disturbance, mostly seismic lines, was essential if operators wanted to move forward uh, to disturb more landscape. So um, well, that's enough, move on from there. So with respect to the other outcomes with the other elements, uh, doing work on air, we worked with the notion uh, of wanting to keep clean areas clean, building upon Alberta's clean air strategy, which is this document. With respect to water and wetlands, we worked beginning with Water for Life, which is the provincial water policy, and the additional criteria that we wanted to protect Fort Mackay's drinking water source, the Ells River, which originates up in there in uh, the Moose Lake area. We wanted to understand groundwater and surface water interaction so that subsurface activity, the impacts of subsurface activity on surface water were well understood. And we also wanted to ensure that wetlands could continue to support the exercise of treaty rights. In the boreal forest, um, the indigenous communities that inhabit the boreal forest, wetlands, which are incredibly diverse ecosystems, are uh, extremely important, especially for uh, medicinal, ceremonial, and, and food plants. <clears throat> Excuse me. Concerning fish and wildlife, uh, we wanted to be able to, to maintain sufficient fish and wildlife policy, fish and wildlife populations, excuse me, to support the exercise of treaty rights of hunting and fishing, with the understanding as well that 10 kilometer, uh, the 10 kilometer zone uh, relative to the movement of large animals is a is a pretty small area and so whatever management was going to be applied to wildlife had to extend of course beyond the 10 kilometer zone with special attention being paid to the impact within it um, we had a number of um, remote wildlife cameras that we put up there just to to try to see what the condition is and what was present up there and there were a few surprises that that emerged um, quite a lot of shots of wolves. This is a wolverine. We've got a, uh, a lynx here that's camped out on a dam. Uh, with uh, We've got some video of it leaping into the air to catch a passing duck that's pretty spectacular. This is a white-tailed deer. Here's a woodland caribou. Um, we found some elk that showed up, which was a real surprise. Uh, uh, elk are not common in the area, but obviously there are some. We've got lots of bears, uh, again, some wolves, a fox, moose. Um, so having a good understanding of what's presently there would help us to measure the impacts of industry. Then there was a business of access management, which we are still working out even after the approval of the plan, and as I mentioned earlier, governance. Now, a really important event for us was the handing down of the decision from the Court of Appeal in April. Uh, the Court of Appeal overturned the AER's approval of the Prosper Rigel project, and that is the first time that an approved project has been overturned in the history of the oil sands. It is, in fact, I think, um, I think there's only one time in its history that the AER did not grant an approval to a project. Um, the court said that AER and Alberta both took, quote, an unreasonably narrow view of the public interest, particularly given reconciliation. And um, uh, treaty rights do not typically become part of the conversation in the regulatory process with the AER. The court emphasized that the honor of the Crown, treaty rights, and the cumulative effects of development had to be dealt with more fulsomely in the regulatory process. And the concurring, or one of the three, panel of three judges, the concurring, sorry, one of the panel of three judges wrote a concurring opinion to the decision to overturn the Prosper Rigel project, in which she said, that the honor of the Crown certainly demands more than allowing the Crown to placate Fort Mackay while its treaty rights careen into obliteration. That is not honorable and it is not reconciliation. Um, pretty, pretty strong statement. In the wake of all of that, uh, we continue to work 
uh, with the province having conversations through the summer. That's also when we undertook our community consultation with the draft plan that had been tabled in May. Uh, and we received news in February of this year that Cabinet had approved the Moose Lake Access Management Plan on the 8th of February. It fits into the hierarchy of provincial land uh, management plans um, in, in this context. Of course, the Alberta Land Stewardship Act applies to the entirety of Alberta. The Lower Athabasca Regional Plan applies to this blue area in the northeast corner of the province. That's the first regional land use plan that Alberta adopted. And then within that you have landscape management plans or sub-regional plans. And it is our hope that uh, during the review of LARP, the 10-year review of LARP, which is scheduled to begin 2022, that the Moose Lake plan will be formally adopted as a sub-regional plan within the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan. Moving to implementation, there are still some issues that remain. Um, one of those is to determine whether this is a, a, a nation, this represents a nation to nation uh, conversation and, and agreement, uh, pardon me. Um, it started certainly that way with Fort Mackay petitioning Alberta to, to uh, protect Moose Lake. Uh, there are some niceties still to be worked out in terms of how the plan will be implemented. Obviously, monitoring is important. We have to keep an eye on those performance indicators to ensure that the plan is proceeding as planned. Um, there are also some elements that did not make it into the final plan, which we are uh, discussing with Alberta now. Um, it has been important to Alberta to make sure that Fort Mackay appreciates that the plan has been adopted as formal policy. So the plan is not subject to change, but there may be an opportunity to address some of these elements that are still outstanding through the plan's implementation. Uh, lastly, access via the Moose Lake Trail. Um, we, we have to sort out how to deal with the Moose Lake Trail. AER had assigned through licenses of occupation uh, some of the trail to different developers. Some of those developers are no longer pursuing projects, Total, uh, Synovus, Canadian Oil and Gas, and so those LOCs either have been surrendered, um, two of them are currently in the hands of the Orphan Well Association because the company went into bankruptcy. Um, the Total and Synovus leases were working directly with the companies to have them transferred. I mentioned again just a moment ago that the LARP review is required in 2022. There are four nations, four First Nations up in this area, um, including us. So that's the Athabasca Chippewan, Fort Mackay, Miccosoo Cree, and the Chippewan Prairie Dene, which is just south of Fort McMurray, worked together with AEP in 2018 and portions of 2019 to suggest some amendments that were required for LARP at the time to address the issues that had been raised by the expert review panel. So we had some amendments to the vision that we wanted to acknowledge um, that the land had to be managed in a way that would support the exercise of the constitutionally protected Section 35 rights um, to the three existing pillars that were economic, environmental and social. We had hoped to have a fourth pillar having to do with Indigenous culture being added as, as a framework through which to develop further aspects of the plan. And we identified some specific strategic directions that we felt, again, were necessary to protect treaty rights and traditional land uses. Now that whole process stalled in 2019 prior to the previous election. When the UCP government uh, came into power in the spring of 2019, part of the instruction that Minister Nixon gave to his department is that he wanted to uh, refocus intention, attention and the importance of regional plans. Uh, so it is our hope that we'll be able to move forward with this work that we have already done with the government as part of that LARP review in 2022. And that would bring us to uh, a conclusion then of the Moose Lake planning discussion. Um, Happy to hear any questions from any of the participants that there may be. 
Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> that was really great. I'm sure all the planners and non-planners on the call were taking notes and writing everything down. <clears throat> <laughs> so as mentioned, um, Councillor Powder, do you want to also turn on your camera? We're going to start the Q&A session. Um, so as before, um, so go to the webinar question box. Uh, and when you click on it, you'll see file, view, and help on the top line. And um, <clears throat> below and just to the left is an orange arrow. Click the arrow, select the question, sub-tab, and below the audio tab and type your question and the space provided. Sorry, that probably didn't even make sense at all, but you guys figured it out before. Um, so I'll just wait for Michelle to hand over the um, uh, ability to see the questions. You're, sure. you're good to go, Glynis. You can see oh. them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I had it closed. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, Michelle, I only see the questions from the earlier presentation. That's sorry. right. So if you scroll down, that's to the very bottom. You'll see where the new ones are coming in that we haven't, that are, are new from this oh. part. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm. I still only see. Um, I'll just wait for them to update. Fair. Oh, here we go. Okay. So you've got yeah. two at the very bottom. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Okay. So. Um, so thanks for the presentations. I've worked with First Nation groups uh, when I was in consultant, and now I'm a municipal employee. Always love learning. Oh, okay. So that was a comment from from someone on the call today. I'm just gonna, all right, I'm gonna keep scrolling. So with, um, um, you know, you shared a lot with treaty and the protection of treaty inherent rights and protecting, you know, the land and, um, and you know, you'd mentioned, you know, like the, the critters and buffers can you talk a little bit more about um can you talk a little bit more about um you know the importance of um good engagement developing those buffers you know like why um you know why like why a good process is needed in order to to do that for the outcome when you were developing those why a good process um well, I believe that um, well, the is go that, ahead, uh, Councillor. Sorry, the the process that is needed and what is required in this um, in this whole large file is that uh, part of the part of the thing is that uh, when you deal with them um, in responding to what your objective is, that you need to actually create a large process, and um, that sometimes may require not just necessarily like a time frame within. Um, what your objective may be, it may, uh, you may think of it as, okay, well, in this quarterly, we're going to accomplish this, but we um, are dealing with the government of Alberta, and we're dealing with our own government uh, in Fort Mackay, so there's necessarily no timelines within this uh, objective, so this process that we're trying to create and all that, it's really needed in order to um, meet our needs and our goals and our vision specifically from our elders and our members and with chief and council and in order to address and meet those needs um, this process needs to be tight it needs to be strategic and it needs to meet the needs of what we are trying to accomplish uh, mike you may want to pipe in here uh, just as part of the um uh, part of the answer I, I what i wanted to say that i think matters is that there's uh, a number of intersecting interests if you will inside the 10 kilometer zone so industry has dispositions that it has received from the province uh, that if projects are approved would allow it to move forward with resource development and and those folks are stakeholders um, one of the things that is bothersome to first nations is when they get identified as stakeholders because they're not First Nations are rights holders. Um, those rights, as I said earlier this morning, go all the way back to the Royal Proclamation of 1776. Um, 
but they also are affirmed in as, as treaty rights in the Constitution, and, and they are affirmed in the treaties themselves. So that's, that's a whole different uh, kettle of fish, if you will, to um, a development privilege that is associated with a lease. And I think that was that was a, a, an area sometimes where we were we ran into some challenges when we had industry at the table because there was a kind of an assumption that if you had a lease, you had a right to develop. Um, but if that were true, we wouldn't need a regulatory process, certainly not an approval process, because the issuance of the lease would constitute an approval. And of course, it doesn't. Um, so uh, uh, an oil sands company or a forestry company's um, quote unquote rights associated with the disposition are maybe not as strong um, as they've argued in the past and they're certainly not the same as the treaty rights that are held by uh, First Nations. So we had to have a conversation to understand that uh, and then it was really important um, which is why I was gratified when everybody agreed to use the outcome model. We had to be in agreement on what the target was. And if we knew what the outcome was going to be, which is what uh, what uh, Councillor Powder was addressing, um, you know, where is it that we want to get to go? If we could get everyone to agree on the outcomes, then figuring out the management actions and the performance measures to achieve those outcomes was I think much simpler than it was trying to identify what the plan looked like in 2018 when uh, industry accused it of being so much more restrictive. There is greater flexibility in an outcome-based plan because the targets are there for everybody. How you achieve those targets, there might be different ways to do that. So there's an opportunity for industry to um, innovate. Uh, but there's also more opportunity then for industry to collaborate because we're all there together. Mm -hmm. Great, that's a great answer from both of you. So uh, when you are, you know, as, as we are asserting our rights every day um, as First Nations, so when you're asserting the rights of the Fort Mackay First Nation, so what are, I guess, like some of your, you know, like some of your tools, um, you know, because it might be somewhat, um, you know, stressful obviously there's lots of more benefit like what are some of the tools that you that you're using to manage that that's the question councillor do you want to take a cut at that one or sure. no problem first of all uh, the tools that we always use is actually asserting who we are basically <laughs> our sovereignty of treaty rights that's what we use as the main foundation of where we're at and that but in dealing with this whole file initially, we did not um, use our, our treaty rights because we want to come as a negotiating in uh, protecting Moose Lake area and the Buffalo Lake area. We want to work at that and we also want to respect that there is policies, there is procedures in place by the government of Alberta that's in place and we want to work with that. And under the Alberta Energy Regulations, there is that uh, application process to uh, develop land and uh, for industry and uh, so we're the interveners and when we're the interveners we want to intervene where you know our objective came out to be that we want to protect and preserve the Moose Lake area and that development was encroaching to the area of the lakes quite closely and to our reserves so we wanted to go through the process of the AR and we did not want to go through litigation because of the fact that we want to negotiate and work under those terms. However, under those negotiating, um, every avenue of that was failed. And because of that failure, we had to respond uh, to the Court of Queen's Bench, which is within the province of Alberta, in asserting our treaty rights. So basically, um, we worked with what we needed to do uh, as far as... Um, the not legislation but uh, the policies and procedures that are placed within the province of Alberta and in response we had to um, use our litigation process and uh, like Mike said earlier in the presentation that this was our first time for Fort Mackay for winning and uh, the um, we knew that when we went through the hearing and uh, I was one of the panelists in January of 2018 that we identified that um, the policy does not necessarily reflect um, First Nations interest 
and uh, specifically so that um, there has never ever been a case where the AER has granted um, um, the, uh, any First Nations who have applied under the Alberta Energy Regulation application that they ever ever won a case and as a result of that we were one of those people again that we didn't win so we took a different approach uh, back in 2019 and it was in the fall that we um, responded and uh, put a document together and we were the litigators and uh, we responded to that. Hopefully that helps Mike and maybe you don't have to answer that question. Oh, that was a great answer. <laughs> I, wanted to think, I wanted to say one little thing. Sure, no uh, problem. And I think sometimes this is, this is a, a, a confusion in the mainstream community between uh, First Nations and, and Métis uh, communities. Um, First Nations don't really need to don't really need to assert their rights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have rights that are expressed in the treaties and the constitution. Uh, so you know that that's that's not even argumentative. Where the challenge becomes is in identify uh, sorry defining those rights. And different parties, um, uh, some parties want to define those rights very narrowly. Uh, First Nations, of course, want those rights to be uh, defined broadly because when the treaties were signed, uh, they were signed by representatives of an oral culture, uh, two cultures that had very little in common, whose world views were not understood. And because they were written in English from a Eurocentric point of view, uh, the treaties represent, um, from First Nations perspective, a very narrow understanding of what rights are. And that's why the courts have become increasingly engaged since about the mid 80s or 90s in uh, uh, helping to define what the rights really are from an improved understanding of what the uh, perspectives of the, the, the signatory parties would have been at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's where our bigger challenge often is um, uh, occurs is that different parties want to define the rights differently. Alberta tends to take a view that treaty rights are subsistence rights. So mm -hmm. what you can eat, well, what you can eat, you know, fish hunt, uh, trapping uh, is is acknowledged. So um, you know, trapping for uh, for trade and for clothing, uh, gathering of plants, but all of those things, as I said earlier, are expressions of a way of life. So that's the central conversation now. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, that's, I agree with both of what you guys shared on that. Um, so with the Moose, La Moose Lake area and its current access, there seems to be limited roadway infrastructure. Are there plans to improve the access? Um, is there any negotiation or is it intent the intention to keep access limited? Currently, the Fort Mackay um, First Nation actually built the road a few years ago so that we actually have a seasonal road. It's a winter road at the moment. And uh, we are looking at, um, we're, we haven't really contemplated or having discussion of year-round road, but we do have uh, access year-round where our members get through there by using um, other uh, terrain vehicles and that. And so... Uh, as far as um, this is actually in the works with the government of Alberta and industry, this is actually all uh, a project solely done by Fort Mackay First Nation. Mm -hmm. And we have not reached out to the government of Alberta or industry or our partners or stakeholders as far as uh, building in that road. Um, there is a little bit of a, a support for there within our, our neighboring community of CNRL, which is just west of Fort Mackay. So who does a little bit help with that as far as um, um, road maintenance and um, access management and entry in that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it, it's a bit of a um, double-edged sword. Um, as Councillor Powder said, access during the summers in particular tends to be on all-terrain vehicles. It's, it's simpler in, in the winter if you jump mm -hmm. on your uh, skidoo. Um, for our elders who can't handle transportation in either of those modes, when when they get up there uh, for seasonal berry picking and other events, we usually charter a helicopter. Cool. Um, now, it, it would be nice uh, for the community if access was less complicated, um, but I think anybody who's familiar with fishing in the east slopes of the Rockies, if you make access um, easier, 
everybody wants to use it. Mm -hmm. And while there's a potential, you know, for people making access of an uh, making use of an improved access, they're not headed to the Moose Lake reserves um, and, and can't come to the Moose Lake reserves without the invitation of the nation. But between Fort Mackay and, and the Moose Lake reserves, it is crown land. And it is uh, challenging to prohibit access to crown land. So um, um, the whole matter of what constitutes a trail, how it may change over time. Uh, Councillor Powder had said that we we worked out a, a winter road if we wanted to do something year round. It's it's still up in the air because the idea here is not to create a new highway mm -hmm. uh, for the general public to be tearing up and down. Okay, awesome, thanks. <clears throat> so you shared and it appears to be um, lots of litigation and uh, most likely not the preferred method to get parties to the table. Were you successful with attempts to mediate regarding the Moose Lake project? I yes. believe that I believe that Fort Pukai was successful in their attempt and their response. However, uh, as far as uh, what we want to proceed with in actually getting to the goal of 10 kilometers, uh, we didn't get that 10 kilometers as um, it kept getting dismissed and dismissed. So yes, we were successful in that say, in that way where Fort Mackay First Nation uh, presented their um, their position and their stance on what we wanted to um, get to our goal of our objective. But as far as the response, um, we were not successful in that way. And so that's why we had to go through a, a major, um, I could say milestone, as far as the time limit in uh, from 2002 until uh, last year when it was ruled in our favor on the court case. Um, but it was something that uh, Fort Mackay did not want to go through the litigation where we want to work with uh, the government of Alberta. So we were successful in some ways, in some ways we were not. So in trying to meet the challenges, we had no other options but to litigate and that's where we're at. But uh, Fort Mackay's um, platform and uh, our success has always not, never to be adversarial, but to create partnerships. And that's what our success has always been uh, based on in our motto is to have good relationship. And in the language of create would be wakutuan, like new wakutuan, that means good relationship. So that's where we're at, but uh, thank you so much, Glynis. Yes, I, was there anything you want to add, Mike? No? Um, so this one, just a quick question. Uh, for the leased lands within the 10 kilometer buffer, can disturbances, i.e. pipelines, be, re be re relocated outside of that area? The question is, would it be relocated? Yeah, outside of the area. They um, Prosper actually withdrew their application and they stopped the project. So that's where the th things are at and that's to the, to, to the shortest details of where um, the uh, lease goes and to where that's at right now. But there are other leaseholders in the area, in the region, uh, near Buffalo Lake and Moose Lake, and uh, most of them uh, have not, none of them have withdrawn, just uh, prospered. There, there was a change though, uh, and Councillor Powder was talking about Fort Mackay's goal initially to be to negotiate, not litigate. So, uh, the Dover project, the SAGD project beneath the reserves that was approved in 2013, initially had planned to put a central processing facility inside what was becoming the 10 kilometer zone. And it was through discussions with Fort Mackay that the company agreed to relocate its central processing facility outside that zone. Uh, the company also agreed to um, uh, to make some changes to try to reduce its footprint inside the 10 kilometer zone. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, I mean, there, there have been opportunities where negotiation directly with a proponent has been successful. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So um, thank you for sharing and experiences and, and with these very important lands, <clears throat> the determination to protect and preserve the, these lands is needed across Alberta and all Canada. Um, so the question is, have you had the opportunity to collaborate with or obtain assistance assistance 
with um, assistance with federal departments such as Health Canada, uh, SARA, Migratory Birds, just to name a few. Um, so if you worked with those departments, um, what departments have been the most supportive to Fort Mackay's efforts to establish the, the impacts to ecological health and community health? Thank you for the general question as far as um, the federal government and the provincial government. Uh, we have received some funding financially from the province and from the federal government. However, as far as uh, support in our initiatives and what we need to do in creating protection, all that, mostly that's all done domest domestically within Fort Mackay First Nation. So our goal has always been um, to really, really get our vision and our direction from our elders and our members. And that's where we get our goal from. But the other part is that um, as far as um, the capacity to support us in that way, we really have not received a whole lot within Fort Mackay First Nation. And um, in addition, I want to add, Glennis, on, uh, for example, when we came forward and we want to address on um, the Lower Athabasca Regional Plan on LARP, and uh, when we want to address that, we address that from Fort Mackay First Nation on identifying our concerns. And one of the things that they didn't did not address on there was the buffer zone. And when they didn't address the buffer zone, that's what we were talking about, the Moose Lake Access Management Plan in creating a buffer to protecting our reserves and also to the uh, to the wetlands and to the lake area. So um, we want we addressed it through that and uh, we, ad we addressed some concerns under Public Lands Administration Regulation also, which is PLAR, which is the pro provincial regulation. So we, we've used these avenues to try to address some of these things and these policies and these legislations that we're trying to come down within the province of Alberta, but um, we never really got that support uh, with respect to the question that was asked. So I don't see any other um, following questions. I just wanted to give opportunity for any closing comments, Councillor Ray and uh, Mike, before we start to wrap up. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for your group and I really, really enjoy this exercise. And you know, you're more than welcome to uh, to do this exercise again. And I. I I can make myself available and uh, I really, really enjoy this moment. I want to say, first of all, say thanks to you and your team, but also to the participants because without you, this would not have uh, been successful and uh, we would not have been able to present, first of all. But uh, I want to just uh, go on a little bit of a, uh, on a note with respect mm -hmm. to uh, Fort Mackay First Nation on the Moose Lake Access Management Plan. You know, despite that we want to create the, uh, the case through the courts and that, uh, we got to understand that the um, the Moose Lake Access Management Plan is a mere policy. It's not a piece of legislation. It's a policy that we use, and how to, we are to work out our arrangements with respect to the government of Alberta and the Fort Mackay First Nation government, and that and. Sorry, just my battery is getting a little bit low, but that's okay. Anyway, so this is a mere policy, as I was saying. It's not a piece of legislation, so it details on how we are to work out the arrangements with respect to protecting Moose Lake. And um, and now that the government of Alberta is more towards on our side with respect to M MLAMP, uh, mm -hmm. it makes it, uh, things a lot better and all that. Although this may not be the maybe the all in all uh, policy. However, uh, it is something that we can work on, and it's actually a platform and a springboard to um, assert our sovereignty and who we are as Fort Mackay First Nation. So thank you, Glennis. Thank you. That was awesome. Mike, any closing comments before we wrap up? Um, I, I don't think so, other than I, I just want to echo on, uh, on Council's behalf and on the community's behalf. Um, what Councillor Powder said about our gratitude to be able to have this conversation. Um, I, I noted that a lot of the, the folks who were online with you uh, were people from the municipality, uh, from municipalities rather, um, and there haven't been a lot of conversations between First Nation, First Nations and municipalities. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it's a really good time uh, to be opening up that dialogue. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to work for Fort Mackay because it is, it is really such an open community. Um, if you've got folks out there who are participants today who want to pursue something more either about what Fort Mackay has done or what its experience might mean elsewhere, um, 
we're pretty open to having those conversations to people who make those inquiries. So mm -hmm. um, if there are people who would like to drill deeper, they can certainly reach out to us to do so. Uh, and I want to thank Chief and Council again uh, because this is a this is a this is a first as far as we know. It's certainly a first for us, and uh, uh, we weren't sure necessarily how it was going to unfold. And I'm 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 pleased that they decided to take the loop the leap and and share Fort Mackay's experience. Thank you. I just want to also say thank you too for. Um, for us working together on on um, being able to present and share today and again i want to sincerely thank chief mel Granjam, councillor powder uh, mike and um, chris johnson and the entire community of the fort mckay first nation for sharing your story of planning challenges and success and how relationship building is is key to positive outcomes and also thank you councillor raymond for the wonderful day thank you okay, take care Bye, Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye,